So in the previous lecture, we arrived to a model of a sample and hold control closed loop system that had variables that change continuously, in particular the physics, and variables that change discreetly, in particular the logic variables of the controller, and this data finite time machine. And we argue that it might be that it is convenient to propose a general model for these kind of systems, because this would pop up when you have combination of physics and computing and their interfaces. And the model that we propose is a model that is written right here in red. You have a differential equation that uh, governs the change of x. x is the full state of the system. All the variables of the individual systems are within it. And every time that the state x is allowed to change continuously, it has to belong to a region of the possible values where that is allowed, and that region is denoted as a C right there. And every time there is a change that is discrete, what we can do for this particular model is to capture the change of x as a difference equation, as you see right here. And very importantly, we need to determine when those changes can happen, and those changes can happen in this particular problem when the timers expire. So we put those timer conditions into our conditions for triggering those changes, abrupt changes, which we call jumps. And those conditions are in this um, set of points uh, that we call D. So we're going to pick it up from here. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we mean by each object and what kind of properties we would like to have for the trajectories to these systems. So. Um, from lecture nine, we are interested in a general model of CPS that has continuous time dynamics. And discrete time dynamics. And there are many ways to do this. The way that I'm proposing to do it is what I'm going to write right now. But again, the literature has many ways. And other ways to model these systems have other advantages and other disadvantages. We don't have time to discuss those, but you can read the literature and figure those out. So in general, we will consider a model as we came up from the sample and hold model, where the right-hand sides are single valued. So we are going to say that this is a differential equation. And we might have at times extra inputs that we are not necessarily assigning to our system as we did in the sample and call. And we're going to call those following the notes for this course gamma. So gamma are inputs that you can apply to your differential equation. Let's imagine that some of the inputs of the plant are not control inputs. Some of the inputs are disturbances. So you can leave those disturbances free, and those disturbances will make your new input for the full system, which, again, we're going to label as gamma, just because U is already used. And then what we can do is to say that whenever the state of the full system and the input uh, satisfy this uh, condition that I'm going to denote by a set C, then I'm allowed x to change according to the differential equation. Um, for the jumps, what we can do is also do the same thing dependence on gamma, but now governed by a difference equation. And whenever x and gamma, the state and the input belong to this set D, then what I can read from here is that the jumps are allowed. So these are a particular class of systems, which you already seen from the simulation toolbox that we suggested you to read about. So this is what is called a hybrid equation.
as you remember from the model of the timer that we use for um, the network model, then we might also have situations where we want the right-hand side, in particular G, to be set value. So that's what we mean by a hybrid inclusion, as I mentioned up here. In that case, we will have that the velocity of x is not necessarily assigned by a particular value of f, but by any value of f. So you can have non-uniqueness during the continuous evolution, and as long as x and the input gamma are in C, and then we can have that the new value of x is some value in the map G when G set value map. Remember, for the timer case, we had an interval for the particular variable that allow us to consider um, all possible switching times within a window. So this is our hybrid inclusion. <clears throat> and just so I note here, so see uh, example 10, where we arrive to this type of model. And then here is, um, remember, the network model uses a set value reset map. And in that case, we can allow that, or we can fit that into this general model because we have now set value map G. So we will consider models of the form. Okay. Almost like a deterministic event. Every lecture it happens. All right. So we will consider the models of the form on the top or at the bottom. And I imagine that you'd be happy and satisfied with either one. It will depend on the project and the system that you want to model. But we will deal with the particular cases starting next week, where x is now a big state. We say the variable or the index n for the dimension of the full state. Remember the plant and p, the controller and c, and so on. So x is the state of the CPS, and this is the full CPS model. And gamma is in some dimension m, is the input to the CPS model. We can also define an output to the system. I'm not going to write it here, but we can also define an output if need. Okay. So again, not to be repetitive, but to just make sure that you follow where we are coming from. We are coming from this model right here, Z, OS, MS, and so on, change continuously unless the timer expires. And that differential equation that you see up there as a general differential equation is what you see here. It's a very specific differential equation. The lecture notes for 149, 249 has the case where FP is a linear map. So it's a linear time invariant system that you want to control. If I, if I have time, I'll show you that. And then you can even see that more concrete because you can have a model of a double integrator or a linearized model of a vehicle, and you can put it right there and you control it with sample and hold using a finite state machine um, algorithm. And then the conditions for flowing in this particular problem, 
C, as you see right here in the example 10, the state components Z and MS and Q and MH do not have any constraint. So you can think about this state uh, region C as I don't care about what Z is doing, what MH, what MS and Q are doing. What I do care is what tau S and tau H are doing. So essentially it's just a restriction on particular components of the state vector. Okay. So what you can think of now is let's say that Z is a scalar and tau S is a real number which is a scalar and MS is a scalar and Q is a scalar and everything. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, dimension six. So you have a vector of dimension six in that case. That will be for the temperature problem, for instance. And then you're thinking about a six dimensional space, Euclidean space, and in that space, you're only allowing flowing in these bands of zero to TS star, zero to TH star for tau S and tau H. The other variables can be anywhere, it doesn't matter. Okay? And then on the boundaries of that band, in particular the TS star and TH star values of the timer, then that's where the event occurs. Okay? And when we projected that into just the tau S TH space, that's the boundary that I'm talking about. That's where the events occur, and we did different views. And when the, the event occurs, then we can change the variables according to the mechanism that we want to implement, and we already discussed how to do that, and we can conveniently model that using, in this case, the hybrid equation that you see right here. In this case, there are no inputs, because everything is assigned. So the function uh, f is only a function of x, and the function g is only a function of x, and d and c depend only on them. Questions? Is it, is it ever that the sets c and d um, can change in time? In our model, we do not allow that. But that could be an addition. Now, my take on that is, depends on the tool you want to use to do analysis, but let's consider that question in this context. Let's suppose that tau s belongs to 0 to ts star of t. Okay, so ts star is no longer a constant, but changes with time. So in that situation, my c will change with time because my right boundary for the condition for tau s changes with time. How can I, how can I make that condition, zero to ts star of t, be a condition only of the states? That only depends on the states. What is t? Time. Who in the state vector, which variable in the state vector below behaves like, like time? The tau. The tau. Yes. Okay. So what I can do is to add another state component, I call it just tau, and tau dot is equal to? One. To one. And then I write down TS star of tau. And now tau is part of x. So that's a little trick that is called embedding time into your state. What is the disadvantage of that, you may not see right now, is that you will have a component of your vector that goes to infinity. So there is an unbounded component, right? Because no matter where you initialize tau, that new tau, it will grow. As time goes to infinity, it will grow to infinity. So you have unbounded state components. Moreover, if you want to really capture time, you need to initialize that variable to Zero. Okay? So there are a few caveats when you do time embedding, but that's one way to do it. You can do that with the events. If you want to count the events, you have a counter. Every time there is an event, you increment it. But if you have infinitely many events, then that counter will go to infinity. But then you can make your conditions depend on how many events you might have had. Okay? 
All right, so we'll get to that um, as we go along. Uh, there is one particular problem we will do the embedding of time. Any other questions about this model? When you say that a timer is a linear time varying system, a timer with resets. Is yeah. it linear and time varying? Which which timer? If you have a timer with resets mm -hmm. that don't do linear and time invariant or variant. So what is that is invariant? The model? Yeah. So when you have a model like this, because time is not part of this um, right-hand side, then it's a time invariant system. What I'm saying is when, when you have a state there is a timer mm -hmm. and it, it has some presets, mm -hmm. uh, is that model a time invariant system? It will depend, again, it will depend on what the model is. From the dynamics I cannot tell you, I need to look at the model. So if the model does not have a dependence on time, there will be time invariant. So, so my proposed embedding will lead to a time invariant model. Okay? For the sample and hope run. But if you leave time allowed, as was proposed in C, then it will be time invariant. Okay. So if you remember a little bit about time invariant and time invariant, if if you look at the z dot equal to a times z plus b times u, when a and b are constant matrices, that's a time invariant model. But if a is a function of time and b is a function of time in linear model, then it's a time invariant. If if a really changes and b really changes. So again, there are tools for time invariant systems, continuous time and discrete time. There are tools for time invariant systems, uh, hybrid time, or hybrid systems. And then there are all tools for hybrid systems that are time invariant. Okay? So it depends which tool you want to use, depends which model you want to settle on. And unfortunately, some tools require that all trajectories are bounded. So then you're back to square one, because if you embedded time, you have trajectories that are unbounded and you cannot apply without any extra um, Argument. Excuse me, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, for the second model, it would use a set value map, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, I'm just thinking if, if there is some model, you know, uh, when, when we do the uh, physical state machine, and then we can, uh, I mean, in the loop, the state loop, there might be you know, a certain point that uh, multiple value will uh, map to one single state. So, I mean, the set value map happen in each state or is possible one to one map or multiple to one map? There is no general answer. I mean there are non-deterministic finite state machines models. We already talk about the chessboard, simplified chessboard game, right? Where every time you want to make a move you have multiple possibilities. So it will depend whether your finite state machine is deterministic or non-deterministic. When it's non-deterministic, then you will need to have a set value g, right? But in certain time, there might be multiple states, not one state. I mean, different. Set or something. So the set valueness here says that from one state you can you can get mapped to multiple states, right? So that set value of the possible values after the event. What you're thinking you're talking about is almost like an injectivity question, which is if I have different values of a state, can I go back to the same state? And the answer you can you can have that, right? Just take the zero map. Zero times x. Any x will map you to zero, right? So you cannot know where you came from from zero because everybody maps you there. So there are these questions, and those are all revealed by by the structure of the of the reset map. So if it is bijective, injective, if it is set value, single value. Okay. As you saw, the, the simulation toolbox allows you to deal with this equation case very easy. It, it handles the set valueness 
or the non-uniqueness, better said, due to the overlap between C and D. And we'll get back to that. So now you have a model, and now you have an input, and a state, and an initial condition. So you, again, in your project, and you've already been doing that in homework assignments, you have a model. And now you can probably, with some effort of reading what we did on Tuesday and the notes, you can put it into this form. OK? Now the question for us is, and we want to start working on that next week, is what would we want x to do, right? That's the whole point. Where do we want x to go? And again, coming back to this example, if we have the plant and the timer and the memory states and the logic variable, then what we probably would like to have is that z belongs to a particular region or eventually gets to a particular region. Okay, or is away from a particular region, or in particular converges to a particular point, right? Think about this as a vehicle or temperature. That's what you're interested in. And then you would like the other variables to kind of play with you to achieve that. And there are some degree of freedom, like for instance, the parameters and the fine state machine transition function. So you need to design those. So for us now is, the question is, is a general question that then we will specify in different projects is, where would x go? Where would the state trajectory go? Okay. So before we define that, we would like to pretty much determine what we mean by a trajectory to the system. Okay. To me, when you look at this, it's intuitive, but when you run around mathematically, you need to make sure that you understand how this happens, right? In particular, suppose that you start at a point that is uh, x and u are, are in c but not in d, it's obvious to me that all you should do is to update x according to x dot equal f of x comma gamma. So you solve the differential equation. And then if you reach a point in d, x and gamma is in d at, after some time, and you cannot flow anymore because let's say the timer doesn't allow it from anymore, then you must execute x plus equal to gx comma gamma. So you execute that. And when you execute that, then you will reset x. Okay? So you go from one value to another value, most likely. Not all the components, but some components. So the first thing that you notice here is that your state trajectory will evolve smoothly if you will, according to the differential equation for some time, and then at some time, it will jump, okay? So if you're familiar with solutions to, or trajectories to continuous time systems, then that doesn't happen. You always have a nice, if you will, a smooth trajectory. So the first thing that we need to identify is how do we handle that discontinuity? So if you play with the hybrid simulation toolbox, then you know that um, you will only take derivative when you evolve continuously. And at the event or the jump time, the derivatives, you cannot compute them because the definition of the derivative says that the left derivative and the right derivative should match, right? So at those points, you don't even worry about the derivatives. And then if after the event, x and gamma are back into c at a point where you can evolve continuously, then you probably will evolve, and then you can take derivatives there. Okay. So that's what we need to resolve here. And we are going to call that the notion of solution and we're gonna do it in general for hybrid inclusions. So given any system that is dynamical, the notion of solution, now solution can, can be um, referred uh, in many ways. Um, so you can say, or trajectory, 
for execution. So these are equivalent. Should be formulated. Okay. Before we get into that, and if you read some of the beginning of the overview of the chapter two of the additional note for 249, you probably kind of start thinking about these things, and I suggest that you do that. But let's revisit a little bit about solutions. To dynamical systems. We did some of this also in the first lecture, just to give you a flavor of what was coming. So if you are considering, in my opinion, the simplest kind of system is a discrete time system. So let's consider a discrete time system um, of the form x plus equal g x comma gamma. Okay. So what is the solution to this? What do you need to be given to you in order to construct a solution? Or construct the evolution of the state in the future? Initial state. Initial state. And the sequence of inputs. The sequence of inputs. Good. Okay. And somehow you rely on some notion of time. Right? Discrete time. Okay. Okay. So as you say, so <coughs> we a notion of discrete time that uses a counter k that belongs in the naturals including zero then given initial state and input, what we can do is to construct a state trajectory or solution. Okay. So there are many you know ways to denote these things. So I would say that the initial state would be x sub zero, and then the input would be a function of k. So it would be a function of k such that u of zero is equal to something, u of one is equal to something, and so on. And from here, what you do is to build the solution. The solution needs to be a function let's abuse and use x for a minute that satisfies so that function satisfies x1 equal to g x uh, not equal to and the input gamma zero. I'm going to change this case to gamma. And then x2, g, 
of x1, comma, gamma 1, and then you can keep going over and over. Okay, does that make sense? So more formally, what we can say let the domain of gamma be a subset of this with zero belonging to the domain of gamma. of the form domain of gamma equal to 0, 1, all the way to capital K. Now I would like capital K to be an element of the matrix including 0, but also to be potential infinity, in which case that means that I could have evolution all the way to infinity. However, if I keep this k here when I pick k infinity, then this will be including infinity, but the domain I want it to be just of the naturals including zero, so I need to intersect here by n. So in other words, what this is saying is that Either my input is defined up to finite time capital K, that is finite, or is defined for all possible natural numbers. Okay? So where domain of gamma denotes the domain of definition of the function gamma, which is the input. Okay. So you're given an input, defined up after some up, up to some time. Okay. Now, given an initial state. X zero, a solution to x plus equal g x gamma is a function and now we're going to make it a little bit with a different label we're going to use this phi that we use all throughout the notes so this is a generic function and the idea that is behind using phi is that I give you a function and the question is, is that a solution? So if I were to write x of k, then I'm somewhat assuming that it's already a state trajectory by the label. So a solution to this is a function that satisfies the following properties. So what properties do we have? Well, first we need to satisfy the initial condition. So essentially, phi at zero needs to be defined and needs to be equal to the initial state that you gain. Otherwise, the phi function that I pick is not a good function. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing, is that now it needs to have a domain property. So the domain of phi needs to be related to the domain of gamma. Okay? 
needs to be related to the domain of time. Now, this is a little bit subtle because if the domain of the input is finite, if my capital K is seven, let's say, I can always compute my solution at eight. Because as you see right here, in order to compute my state at time equal one, all I need to have is a state at time equals zero and the input at time equals zero, okay? So if my input is just with k equal to seven, I would be able to do that all the way to x of eight. So I'd be able to generate a solution that has a little extra point than the input, just because I don't use it to compute um, the values all the time. So what this is saying here is that the domain of phi will need to be equal to the domain of gamma if j is equal to infinity. Okay? And if j is finite, then the domain of phi, which is a set, minus the, if it is finite, you have a maximum, the maximum of the domain of phi, so you remove that point, which in this case I will remove eight, needs to be equal to the domain of gamma if j finite. The good news is that all, most times we worry about inputs that are defined for all time. But in practice, you don't have that. Right? But in theory, you say, okay, my input is having a domain that includes 0, 1, 2, all the way to infinity. Again, infinity is not an element of the naturals. And then you're in the first case. So the solution that you generate should have the same domain as the solution, as the input that you apply if the domain of the input is unbound. Okay. And then the last but very, very important thing is that that phi should satisfy this condition, dynamics. Okay, so what this means is that for every k in the domain of gamma, so for every discrete time, phi of k plus 1 is equal to what? What do the dynamics, the dynamics tell me about what phi should satisfy? Well, we want to construct a solution to this guy, right? Phi zero and gamma zero should generate. The first state. Right, let's go again. Up here on the x, right? on the x, we have that x0 and gamma 0 generate x1. x1, gamma 1 generate x2. And you keep going and going. So if I want phi to be satisfied with dynamics, phi 0 and gamma 0 should generate phi 1. So phi of k plus 1 should be equal to G of phi at zero, gamma zero. For k equal zero, and for every k, this should be the previous k. What 
is the difference between J and the K? I'm sorry, it's just that I'm a sloppy. It's K. We will use J for the hybrid. My brain is polluted. Let's do an example and let's walk through this. This is important. Okay, it's, it's, it's important. All right, so let, let's go simple now. Let's go back to this, which I guess everybody understood. And now let's say consider x plus equal to one half x plus gamma. Okay, so that's my discrete time model. Someone gave me this, that's my difference equation. So from here, what we can identify is that the function g x gamma is no more than this one half x plus gamma. Okay, yeah? All right, so now given x zero equal one and gamma defined as gamma zero equal to gamma one equal to gamma two equal to all the way as many numbers as you want equals zero show that the function phi defined as phi of zero equal to one, phi of one equal to one half, phi of two equal to one fourth, phi of three equal to one eighth, phi of k equal to one over what should I write? Two to the k is a solution to x plus equal g x comma gamma from x zero with the given gamma input. So someone gives a system, someone gives an initial condition, someone gives an input. You typically need to figure out the, the solution, but let me just give it to you so now we can walk through the definition. Okay? So let's do this together. And, and the one that I'm giving you is supposed to be, unless I made a mistake, supposed to be a solution. Okay? So I should be able to check these definitions that I have here. So let's do that. So here's our definition, right? So given of here. Given initial is okay now. It's all the way, right? So given this input and given this initial state, then we need to satisfy our, this is our definition of solution for x plus equal g x u. Gamma.
So we have that. So let's put that right there. And now let's zoom out here and work on that. Okay. So the first thing that we have to check is the initial condition. Okay. So let's check definition about. First, initial condition. So what is P of zero? Is one divided by one, right? Is one. And what is X zero? Is one then P of zero is equal to X zero. So this initial condition checks, okay? You with me? Any questions about that? Again, I grab P of K, which is generically one over two to the K, and I pick K equal to zero, that gives me one. The initial condition is one, they match, this is satisfied. Up here. Okay, now domain. What is the domain of gamma? Well, according to this definition, the domain of gamma is the entire non-negative integers or natural to zero, however you want to call it. Uh, and capital K is equal to infinity. In other words, if you were to, to, to take the, the maximum on the domain, the maximum does not exist, but the supremum on the domain exists. And the supremum is the largest upper bound. No matter what number you pick in naturals, there's always a larger number in the domain. So the largest upper bound is infinity. OK? So that's the supremum. So this is actually this is the supremum of the domain of gamma, infinity. So that's the domain for gamma. What is the domain for phi? Well, according to this definition, this is defined for every k. So this is also there's no restriction, right? That's my domain. So then the domain of gamma is equal to the domain of phi with the k equal to infinity, so this is good to go. Okay? You with me? Okay. One situation that this will work if I say the input is defined up to seven and phi is defined up to nine. Right? I will leave the input at 8. I don't have it. In this case, I don't have the match with the finite k. All right. Now the last one is the dynamics. What do we need to satisfy for the dynamics? OK. We need to check that for every k in the domain of the input, we have this property. Okay, so we can do it by essentially using the generic expression of P. Okay, so we need to check this. We have phi k for us to play with. So on one hand, we have phi of k, which is 1 over 2 to the k. Now what we can do is to compute phi of k plus 1. What would that be? If I have phi of k is 1 over 2k, I take that same expression and I replace k by k plus 1. Again, if you have a function and you write a particular argument, you pick a particular argument, 
then you're evaluating that function at that argument. So the first thing I wrote is phi evaluated at k. All I'm asking now is what is phi evaluated at k plus one, okay? So what is the function here? So the function is, I pick k, I assign this k. If I pick k plus one, I assign this k to k plus one. I can, I can evaluate phi at 25, right? And then it will be one over two to the 25. Okay, so this is evaluation of a function. And by doing this, keep in mind, you're not defining the function, you're just evaluating it, okay? All right, so this is one over two to the k plus one. So now the question for us is, do we have this guy? Do we have this guy? So now, what we want to do from here is to evaluate g of phi k comma gamma k. So from the definition of this, and with the given gamma, because this gamma is always zero by choice, then what we have is that I only have one half of x. So when I evaluate this g at phi k, what I have is what? One half phi k. Right? So again, the first argument of this function is x. The second argument is gamma. Gamma is zero. So the plus gamma is zero. And now I have one half times x evaluated at phi k. The variable is x, I replace x by phi k, and that's what I get. And what is one half of phi k from the definition of phi k? So it's one over two, and then one over two to the k. And what is that? One over two to the k plus one, right? Which surprisingly is what? phi of k plus one. Okay, so what happens is that phi of k plus one is equal to that. And that happens for every k. And that checks that. Okay? So this is now that you look at it, is <clears throat> almost like too simple, right? But that's the mechanism that we do to compute or to define the solutions for our system. You give an initial condition, you give it an input. Now, does this function satisfy the dynamics? Of course, the initial conditions should match, third piece. The function should be defined in the right range second piece, that's almost for granted when you pick the right initial condition and when the inputs are defined forever, okay? Almost for granted. Then what you do is to make sure that those functions satisfy the dynamics, and that's what you do, okay? So this is how we learn to solve differential equations. You're giving a linear differential equation and someone says, you know, in order to solve this, why don't you try linear expressions in terms of exponentials and trigonometric functions and plug it into the differential equation with free, com free, free uh, parameters and then solve for the parameters. So there was an intuition there that uh, linear combinations of exponentials will, will work for you. Okay? When it's non-linear, then it's a little bit more complicated. The good news is that, as you know, you can always, almost always, get a nice approximation numerically of these solutions. So we will not really need to compute this, but we need <coughs> to know how they look like, okay? So what we're gonna do is to take a five minute break, and I will let you to think about how we could define the same kind of notion for the continuous time dynamics, okay? This almost takes care of the jump part, right? But what about the continuous part? Make sense? And then we're going to combine them. Okay, let's presume at 9 o'clock.